Amen. Well, I want to, um, what I want to share tonight really is more or less setting up what I want to end with tomorrow night. Uh, and I don't think we would fully understand it. Uh, I, I, I don't think we'll understand it by the end of this night as much, <clears throat> but the, there are elements in this um, uh, uh, chapter uh, of Numbers 19 that pertain to certain things that I desire to, to get into. And I, I've shared much on it. There's, I got a whole book on the red heifer, you know, and, uh, the Lord is still just showing me things that just, um, show me that in certain scriptures, um, uh, we, we formulate what we think they're saying and then God breaks through and, tells us what they're saying. And so that's what I want to get into, but I want to set it up tonight. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to Numbers uh, chapter 19. <clears throat> now, the things I'm going to begin to point out may not seem that important. <clears throat> or they may seem like, well, yeah, because that's what Jesus is like or something. We will we will very quickly <clears throat> relegate them to familiar truths. We relegate everything within the realm of what's familiar to us. And, uh, and sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad because we, we may miss the Lord on a, on, a, on a regular basis of Him trying to reach us. All right, so I want to start with verse 1 and 2, <clears throat> Numbers 19. Now the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, This is the statute of the law which the Lord has commanded. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer without defect in which there is no blemish and upon which a yoke has never been. All right, so this first part is tell the people. This is for the, tell the whole congregation, the people of Israel, tell them this. This is a statute. Uh, when God says it's a statute or, or any of those things, we automatically think, well, it's the rules by which God wants us to, to live. When in reality, they came first from the inside of him before there was a world, before there was a material thing, before there was us, before there were all these things that we weigh and judge and think that we know stuff based on all of that. But we have to, when he says stuff like this, we have to go back to his heart and we have to find the thing, the reason behind it, the thing that has brought it forth. So... Um, he says, you know, he says, this is for the whole group. This is you and this is me. This is all of us. There's nobody left out. It's for all of us. Um, tell the people to bring you a red heifer. Okay. And bring one that is without defect. Okay without blemish, okay, and no yoke on it, okay? So the, the offering is going to be, and here's where we'll all say, well, I know what this is about then. The offering is going to be not blemished. It's not going to be blemished. It's not going to be defective. But this offering is for us, and we are blemished, and we are defective. Okay, so, but don't, don't start adding up the numbers so that you can get it. Because I always did. And I've missed it for years and years. So, um, and then he says, um, no yoke, basically. Never a yoke has been on him. He's never, this, this sacrifice has never been in bondage. 
He's never been in bondage. He's not like the other ones out there. He's not like the other auction. He's not like the other heifers. He's not like them. He has never been in bondage. He has never had a defect. He has never had a blemish that was a problem. But we have, we have, and we have been in bondage. And yet, this is for us. That's what he's talking about. All right, verse 3 and 4. And you shall give her, and, and I'm not going to get into the her part of this right now or tonight. <clears throat> and you shall give her to Eliezer the priest. And she shall be taken outside the camp. Taken outside the camp and slaughtered. Okay. Before him, and Eliezer the priest shall take some of her blood with his finger and sprinkle some of her blood toward the front of the tent of the meeting seven times. So this one, this one who is without blemish, without defect, who's never been in bondage, take that one and put him outside the camp. Put it outside the camp. And when you get it out there, slaughter it. All right, well, the offering, the red heifer, deserves to be inside the camp, deserves to be in the camp. It does. It deserves to be in the camp. In fact, we deserve to be put out. We do. We deserve that. Slaughtered when we should have been slaughtered. And not just slaughtered in a, in a nice way. You could say, you know, you could almost say, uh, uh, you, I mean, I, we just romanticize everything, but you, you go into the, the camp and you go into the, um, uh, the, the time where they're slaughtering the am, animals for the, the atonement of sin and the goat to, to atone for the sins that year. And when we read the story of it, it's so beautiful. It's so, oh, this is, this is the Lord. This is a shadow. Look at this. But when you read the fulfillment of it, Jesus is taken before wicked men and he's, he's slapped. He's beaten. He's all of this brutality is put upon him. All of these false accusations are put upon him, which were our own sins. It was us because he never sinned. And you begin to get a whole nother picture of that offering and of that, what that represented to Jesus. It's not, it's not romantic at all, you know. Well, the red heifer could have said, Oh, I thought I was going to be brought in before the people. And yes, I'm, I'm without sin and I haven't done anything wrong and this and that. And, you know, and I'm going to go into the, you know, into the tabernacle and there on the altar there I'm going to be you know just this romanticizing of it but no this is you know everything that you have done to be right won't save you verse 9 and a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up outside the camp in a clean place. And it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. Okay, so... You have a clean person. This isn't even referring to the red heifer now. You have a clean person. And they're having to go outside the camp also. And this clean person is gathering the ashes for you. 
and for me and for all of us. And they're being kept for the people in the camp who deserve to be put out. They're being kept for them. They're being kept for the living within the camp that should have been slaughtered. They're being kept for them. And they're being kept for uh, the, the sin, if you will, the particular sin in relationship to the red heifer. Whereas he never sinned either. The clean person had never, in that sense, he was clean. There was no issue with him. That the ashes are for you, kept for the congregation, for your, for my impurity, not, not, not the Lord's, not the, the red heifers, not the clean person. For your removal of sin. Okay. But he had to go outside that camp. He had to deal with all of that when he was clean. Okay. I want to read a little bit different translation here. And a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and deposit them outside the camp in a clean place. And they shall be kept for the congregation of the people of Israel for the water of impurity, for the removal of sin. All right, now verse 10. <clears throat> and he that gathereth the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes. This is the clean person. And he that gathereth the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening, and it shall be unto the children of Israel and, uh, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among them for a statute forever. So this clean person was clean, but he became in the process of doing what he's doing, became unclean. He wasn't doing it for himself because he was clean. Does that make sense? He was doing it for the unclean so that they may be clean while the very act of doing it has made him unclean. And this is a statute forever. This is forever. The things that I've already read that's forever. That's forever. That's not going to change. Wow. It's powerful. It's not going to change. This is the way the Lord wants to do it. And this is the way he did it. And this is the way with the red heifer and the clean person, they did it. So I wrote, he was clean, but became unclean for you. So this is this little simple part here is really extremely important to the next to, to tomorrow night. We'll get into some more, but this, it's extremely important. And again, it seems so known to us. So known, yes. But if it is so known, then there are certain places in the scripture that we should be able to see it with clarity. And part of tomorrow night is going to be giving us a, a, a set of scriptures that we all felt like we knew. And yet we miss the real point of God's heart in it. All right. So. What was, the, what was the sin? The sin was touching the dead. And I don't want to get too much into that. I'll read the scriptures for you and I'll mention a few things. But, you know, the, the book called uh, Offering of the Red Heifer, is that what the name of it is? What? The Ashes of the Red Heifer. Um, it's one of the chapters is all about the ashes and one of the there's different chapters in it and it spells out 
a lot of this that is really, really uh, good. If you haven't had a chance to meditate on it, the good thing is, is that this offering of the red heifer, we'll get into that in just a second, this offering of the red heifer, you get to do it on the third day, which would be tomorrow night, because we started Thanksgiving, and the seventh day. So you'll still have, even when this is over with, four more days. How's that sound? And you, you will want to follow up once you hear some of this. <laughs> okay, verse says, 10b, that means the B part of verse 10 through 12. And this shall be to the people of Israel and to the stranger who sojourneth among you a perpetual stature. Verse 11, he who toucheth the dead body of any person shall be unclean seven days. He shall cleanse himself with the water on the third day and on the, the uh, let's see, and on the seventh day, and so be clean. If he does not cleanse himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not become clean. Well, there's a little curveball. <laughs> you know, so maybe, I don't even know what day is the, what day is the seventh day from Wednesday. Anybody? What? Yeah, I would assume Tuesday. Maybe we should we just should have some sort of get together on Tuesday, just over this, and all meet, and wash just one more time. Amen. You know. <clears throat> all right. So, um, seventh day, and so be clean uh, on the third day, and on the seventh day, and so be clean. But if he does not cleanse himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he shall not become clean. He shall not become clean. And this is, I, I, it didn't say he shall not be clean. It said he won't become that. Yeah. All right. So again, perpetual statute. If you touch a dead body, you are unclean. Now there, now that booklet again about the ashes of the red heifer, um, has quite a bit in there about touching the dead. It's not really just, you know, if you're, I don't want to say, I was going to say if your grandmama dropped dead, but let's, <laughs> if somebody died and you somehow didn't know they were dead and you tried to wake them up, that's, you, that's not just the only part of that. Yes, there was a physical thing, but there's a spiritual thing. God doesn't, God doesn't, care about touching dead people as much as he cares about the thing that's in that booklet. And it would bless you. It would, it would help you. It would open your eyes to some things. Um, and, and maybe if you've already read it, it might be good to go back over it just because the explosion of all the people that have been sharing and yet will be sharing are bringing in so many cool angles of the Lord that bring, it can open our eyes it can open our hearts. It can put us in a better place. It could, you know, I can see a family opening the book and gathering the family around saying, let's read through this. Let's just read through this, you know. And what, are, you know, and, and the, the, the evening, the morning and the evening sacrifice rising to the Lord in true spirit of what it meant. Okay, and um, so if he doesn't do it then, and do it on both days, then he's, he's, he's not clean. All right, verse 13. Um, Whoso toucheth the, the dead body of any man that is dead and and purifieth not himself, defileth the tabernacle of the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from Israel, because the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him. He shall be unclean. His uncleanness is yet upon him. Okay? <clears throat> so whoever touches a dead body, what is, what is the 
first consequence of that or what is the consequence of that that is personal to us? Because that's usually what we want to know. You know, well, how does that affect me? And, you know, I'm in the center of the whole thing and I need to know, you know. But it's, it's better, it's better to be Christ first in your thinking, not just in your theology. But my first thought is, how does this affect the Lord? I want to know how this affects the Lord. I want to know that what I'm doing, how it's affecting him, and not just assume that it's okay because it seems okay and everybody does it and they're all Christians and it's got to be right. No. Robert, there's a little lag on this picture, so I want to do one of those things that we were talking about. Okay, I'm going to punch myself. Never mind. That's a joke. It's a little inside joke there. Okay, so uh, what is the consequences? Cut off, oh my goodness, what is the wording? From his people. Cut off from his people. Well, you can read that, cut off from the Lord's people. You can read that, cut off from your people. Not talking about your family, but they're your people. I mean, I, I don't want to be cut off from, I mean, you know, I love this body. And I love the hunger that they have, and I love the desire. And I, I love the fact that, you know, we talk about freedom of religion. I am thankful for the freedom of being able to preach Christ crucified with a bunch of people who believe it. You know? Because, you know. Could be a bunch of people that just want to crucify you for preaching it. You know? <laughs> All right, so the, so the first one is cut off from his people. I don't want to be that. I don't want that. Uh, da, 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 da. But it said that you defile the house of God. You defile the place that God lives. You defile what is God's, the house of God, the house of God. Isn't that what, isn't, is that the wording? I'm going to get in the tabernacle of the Lord, which was the house of God. God was there. That was his place. You know, when the tabernacle was going, and that's at this time in Numbers, <clears throat> there wasn't a whole lot of people sleeping in the tabernacle. You know, well, you know, like they had homeless people or something. They go, well, here's an empty place. Let's go in here. You know, no, that's God's house. <clears throat> Well, what if, what if a person didn't know this? <clears throat> so you say, you say uh, I didn't know the statute. Well, it's not about not knowing the statute. It's not Pharisees want to know every statute. It's about knowing the Lord. It's not about the statute because there will be something in us that will rebel against it or we'll ignore it, or whatever else. We're all in danger if all we're trying to do is figure out what I need to do and what I need to stop doing so that God will be happy, then we're missing the whole point of it. We need to turn from our evil self. <laughs> I was going to say evil ways, but those evil ways come from us. We need to turn from our good self. We need to find the Lord in a, such a real way that we won't have to think about what affects him or we won't have to think about um, what I should do or all those things that were so troubled. Well, people say, well, I just don't know how to hear from the Lord. Well, okay, how about just... Stop trying to hear from the Lord and say, Lord, I want to know you. And in knowing you, I will understand you. And there will be, because there's a whole level of discernment that has nothing to do with the gift of discernment. It is you know what he's going to do because you know him. You say, well, how do we, you know, is that even possible? Yes, it is. It is. So, let's turn to uh, Hebrews 13. Let 
Hebrews 13. <clears throat> Now, in Hebrews 13, <clears throat> um, the, there is really three parts, or you could say, and I've heard that used recently, uh, even in the gathering this year from people about the share, somebody sharing was like a sandwich or whatever. That's what this is. It's like a sandwich, okay? So what is a sandwich? Usually, it's probably a lot more than this, but we're gonna go with the basic one they probably had, because they probably didn't have little mustard jars and stuff like that, and you know, mayonnaise and go, I think I'll have a, you know. Uh, probably bread and meat, you know what I mean? <laughs> or something. Sandwich, two pieces of bread with the meat in between. Well, that's what we're gonna look at in Hebrews 13. We're gonna look first at the bread on this side and the bread on this side, and then we're going to look at what the meat of it is about and why this piece of bread is covering it from this side and this one from that side. Or you could lift it like this and you could say in the Holy of Holies, there was a cherubim here and a cherubim here, but that really wasn't the deal. They're covering, they're covering that which is between them, which is the Lord and crying holy, 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 and all of that, declaring the Lord, speaking of the Lord. They're not going, well, you know, talking to each other and going, what, what's the weather going to be like today? You know, <laughs> they got one focus, and that focus is him. <clears throat> so we're going to look at the first, we're going to call it side one of the bread. And this is verse 5 through 7, Hebrews 13, 5 through 7. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And of course, the word conversation here is actually the word uh, manner of life. Let your manner of life be without covetousness. Okay, so covetousness is what? I want this. I want that. I would like this. I see. I, I, I. Okay. And, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. See, see, don't be covetous because he said, I'm going to be there. I'm there. I, stop thinking about the things you want me to give you. Think about me. Does that make sense to everybody? <laughs> Think of me. For I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Well, is he there when you're freaking out over stuff? Yeah. But your emphasis is not him. Your emphasis is the freak out. Well, there's, it's the earth. It's, it's the devil or it's, uh, you know, this or that. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. All right. <clears throat> Verse seven, remember them that had the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their manner of life. Hmm. That verse seven bumps right up against the meat. Okay. Remember them that have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. All right. So this is God speaking. This is his word. And he is saying, I have sent people to tell you certain things that are important. Don't think you know it all. I'm talking to them to talk to you. They're, it's not that they're that important because they're not. They're just servants and messengers. But you need to, what is it? Remember them. Well, I, do, I remember who they are. <laughs> which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. Didn't say follow them. It says their faith, their faith. What kind of faith? Not faith for, for, for well, I want to get me a, a, a BMW, and I'm believing for that. You know, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be like Randy and get me a, a Dodge pickup. <laughs> so... Um, considering the end of their manner of life. The manner of life, the, what the goal of that is. All right. All right. Let's look at side two 
on the other side of the meat, and that's starting at verse um, 16 and 17. <clears throat> so this is the second slice of bread on the other side. But to do good and to communicate uh, really means to share. Forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you sub and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Now, this is every bit as much the word of God, folks, as, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his own. How come everybody can't quote these? <laughs> you know? Obey the, those that have the rules. Submit. For they watch, why, why? Because they're the bosses and they're the people who, uh, you know, uh, it, it's like a corporation and we need to treat it like that. No, no, no. They're, they are charged to watch for your souls that they, because they're going to have to give an account for you. Whatever your, whatever your little things that you're doing and all that kind of stuff, um, it, you're not the only one going to stand before God for it. That they, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Okay, so, um, but th these two things are not the meat. They're the bread. Uh, we want, we, you know, what's the, the saying? We have the meats. Or for some of you who are older, where's the beef? <laughs> okay, <laughs> it, is, it is within those two things. There's something in there that's special. It tastes so good. And it's going to be a joy. And it's going to be uh, what exactly the Lord wants to say to us. Exactly what the Lord wants to say to us. And, it, and one of his main reasons for us all being together from different countries and different states and different cities and uh, so that we might hear something that he decided to deposit in a, a lowly servant messenger boy. You heard the old saying, don't kill the messenger. <laughs> well, they kind of do that in the Old Testament, the prophets and everything. It's what we do. <laughs> we kill the messengers. <laughs> You know, we don't, you know, we don't want to, but, you know, it's been worked in our DNA. <clears throat> so, <laughs> um, all right, so, um, so here's the meat. Verse, this is still Hebrews 13, verse 10 through 13. Um, <clears throat> we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate or outside the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, outside the, the gate, I mean, uh, outside the camp, Bearing his reproach. All right. So the first thing that is of note, uh, and maybe you're with me on this one, and that is we have an altar. Has anybody ever read this and maybe read it over and over many times and gone, you know, I'm really not sure what that altar is that he's talking about. Anybody ever done that? I mean, because, you know, it's like, okay, we have an altar, but you want to point it out or whatever, you know, we can say, what's the cross? Or, you know, we, we're good at that. You know, it's Jesus revealed, or, you know, we, that's the, always the easy answer around here. You know, the revelation of Christ or the cross. Um, but we have an altar that they have no right to eat of. Wow. <laughs> they don't even know about it. 
All right, verse 12, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people uh, with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Jesus is the red heifer, okay? Jesus is clearly the red heifer, and he's the red heifer for the congregation. Do you agree? Okay, he's, a he's for the congregation. He's for all of us. All the things that we've already gone through, why we went through Numbers 19 up to this point, so that we can see that there are certain things that are uh, congruent with the Old Testament and with what Jesus did. Uh, so, well, let's look a little closer then. Verse 10, we have an altar where they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. Okay, so this is an altar that we have, whether we know it or not, whether we partake of it or eat from it or not, we have it. It's not something that we have to earn. It's like the offering of the red heifer, if you will. It's like that which was put to death and the sacrifice was given long ago so that when the need came up, we didn't have to go and do another altar, as it were, to get this. It's like that, or similar to that. <clears throat> and then it says we have an altar where they have no right to eat. Okay? They don't have any right to eat of this. And it's talking about the priests and the stuff of the Old Testament. They don't have any right they don't have any right. They don't have the right. So what is this altar that we have? That we eat or partake of? Well, in verse 10 here, In verse 10, there's some clues going on here. And the clue is this, that it's talking about two groups. Okay? The first group is we. We. The second group is they. They. All right. So, are you ready to dig into the meat? <clears throat> We're not going to do that tonight. <laughs> so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just do a little close here, and then I want to go back to uh, some scriptures. I, I'm going to let this lie after I finish this little part here um, and go back to some scriptures that will help us a little more with some of the red heifer understanding and with the ashes and with the effect in, in other people's lives, some of that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, so I wrote, in the name of the Lord, I'm asking you not to miss tomorrow night. Now, I wrote, why should I, you know, speaking as if somebody just heard this, why should I be here for the next class? Okay. Um, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourself, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So, the reason why you should is because I'm asking you to for your good, and I'm asking you to because I heard it from the Lord and it's coming from the Lord, and I know that he wants you to have it, and I'm asking you because I'm going to have to stand before the Lord for it, so I'm 
I'm just dropping this dime right now. <laughs> All right. So, um, <clears throat> I wanted to lead up now. Just We're, we're kind of leaving that that we talked about there in Hebrews 13 over here. Uh, you'll have tonight and tomorrow up till tomorrow night to dig in and, you know, play with the, with the coins <laughs> of, the, of the treasure of it. <clears throat> uh, should the Lord show you, and I, I have no doubt, that's one reason why I want you to do it, because I, I have no doubt that some of you are going to see it, and that will be a joy to me, because that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit, and that's what he wants to do. <clears throat> All right, so Genesis, I want to I wanna just, uh, let's go to Genesis 18, 27. Now, this may not fully benefit everybody here, but there's a vast majority of you that it will. <clears throat> Genesis 18, y'all remember Genesis 18? Anybody remember that one? Yeah, what we were talking about was, <clears throat> was Abraham. In chapter 15, he called God Adonai, not understanding what that meant. And I'm not going to go through a big, long thing on it, just, but it is to say that when you're going through the sufferings of Christ, God specifically will have one of the Trinity or two or all of them as your Adonai who will literally help you not take away the problems and not take away the, the sufferings of Christ, but to help you fellowship and partake of those. Like Paul prayed, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. That was a knowing that Paul wanted to have. And I think some of you and some of me, some, you know, me earlier on, I always wanted, you know, that first, at first I wanted the power of his resurrection. That's what I want to know. I'd read the rest of it, though, you know, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. But I wanted the power of his resurrection, not knowing that the power of it is the depth, the depth of the death that we go into. Um, <clears throat> the fellowship of his sufferings, and I always kind of pass over that and go, uh, I want to be made conformable to his death, meaning some theological reality that I died with Christ and I want to get it solidified in me so that when I preach, people go, this man knows the Lord. And, you know, he's destroyed all that. And now <laughs> I'm pretty much just, you know, I just want to fellowship with him now in the reality of, the, of his sufferings entering into it, partaking with him in a spirit that will touch his heart and bless him. Abraham <clears throat> had no idea of that. Abraham was lost to that. He was the exact opposite. All he could think of in chapter 15 up to 18 was himself and what God had promised him and why hadn't he got it yet. That's the short version. <clears throat> chapter 18 begins with God, Elohim, the three and one, the three gentlemen walking in that came in to the camp was God. And he recognized them as God. And he ran over and he fell, threw himself down on the ground and he called him Adonai. And um, um, he jumped up, to, he told him what he wanted to do and it was all to bless, to bless him, to bless him in all the, the best ways that we find in the New Testament. The, the, the thing that Mary Bethany did, the thing the prodigal son did, the, just all of these different things. Abraham did it all in one pale swoop. And he was just, I want to give you the best of the best. And, and God hardly spoke at all. You know, you know it's like, well, well if you're, God, what are you here for? <laughs> You know, I mean, I mean, if the three and one walked into your house or walked up to your door and knocked and whatever, you go, what are you here for? Or what did I do? <laughs> you know? But that, we, you know, we get it. We're all into us again. It's always into us, see? And that's why we don't know Adonai, because that's the one that we, sh we just get low. We get as low as we possibly can. And, and so he's just 
pouring out the blessings on them and enjoying. He stands by and watches them eat, and he stands by and just, he just takes care of them in so many ways, washes their feet and all of this stuff. And um, so um, there comes a point where he wants to talk to God about where he's headed, which is about Lot, right? So I want to just read verse 27 to you, and it says this. Uh, this is after he's blessed out or nine, then all this stuff. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Dust and ashes. He's just ashes. He's just dust. He's low, as low can be in a right spirit, and he's proved it by his actions, by putting the Lord first, taking care of the Lord, thinking about the Lord, not going, well, you're God and you got everything. Why should I do that? You should be taking care of me. That's some people's spirit. And they, they deny that there's any place for us to bless the Lord, take care of the Lord, think about the Lord, all that stuff. They think it's a waste of time. But Abraham didn't, and he's the father of faith, so the scriptures tell us to follow the faith of Abraham. So anyway, <clears throat> um, so he's, he's dust and ashes. He's so low. I mean, dust is like low on the ground, and ashes is like taking whatever greatness, any, any you know, a, a, a heifer or a bull, and reducing it down to the smallest thing that you can make it, the lowest thing that you can make it. All right. So now, Exodus chapter 9 and verse 8. And now we're going to talk about Moses. And I just love this, this little scripture here. And, uh, and the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take you, or gather up, take you handfuls of ashes. Take you, gather up the ashes of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven. Don't read any further yet, or because uh, I'm not going to deal with that. But just consider that God is saying, here he is. He's dealing, he's in the land of the Egyptians. With He's before the greatest Egyptian of them all. Uh, and he's taking ashes. And he's sprinkling them towards heaven. You like this, Lord? <laughs> you know. You know, is this, does this please you? They would go, they would go, cut this man's head off. Our gods are angry at you because of, you know, this spirit that you have throwing ashes in God's face. Oh, see, we just don't understand. We just don't understand. There's more power in those ashes than in your spear. <clears throat> so, and he's given it toward heaven, you know. It's like, here, God, I'm going to give you the least. <laughs> All right, Leviticus 1.16. I love this one, too. I really do. Leviticus 1.16. <clears throat> and he shall pluck away his crop, this is talking about the dove, with his feathers, and cast it beside the altar on the east part, by the place of the ashes. Right there beside the altar is the place of the ashes. Right there, it's just nestled up against the altar. It's just, we're part and parcel of this. This is, you know, uh, it's almost like the ash heap could say, we get to get the, the leftovers, but greater than that, we get to get everything more in a more pure form. Let me tell you, when you're full of yourself, when you're full of your, all your, what you're doing or all these things, when you're full of all of that stuff, man, that's the worst to God. When you're reduced down to ashes in a sense of a spirit that honors God, I'm not talking about beat down and beat up and all that. I'm talking about having all of the stuff that just wants to glory in itself not just dealt with, I'm going to deal with you. No, no, I'm going to reduce you down. You're going to decrease and I'm going to increase. Are we okay with that, anybody? Yes. Really, that's it? Yeah, there's a lot of 
<laughs> I heard them on the thing, and they were louder than y'all were in the room. So, <clears throat> all right. So, um, the place of the ashes, the place, the place. There's a place of the ashes. Well, where would it be? Where would it be? Well, you got to go to the altar. I got to go to the altar. <laughs> yeah, you do. Because it's not separate from it. The altar has to be first applied to your, your, you know, bullock, your whatever, your strength. All right, Leviticus 4.12. <clears throat> Even the whole bullock shall he carry forth outside the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out. The clean place is where the ashes are poured out outside the camp. Now, Numbers 19 said that. Did you, did you catch it? That's the clean place is where the ashes are poured out. It's like, well, this is, you know, I mean, if you, it, you know, like Abraham said, I'm dust and ashes. If, if you said uh, your parents told you, I want you to clean this house. And, uh, and so they left. And when they came back, you know, there was a corner over here full of dust and ashes. Well, this is, a, this is the cleanest place of the house. I've been reading the Word of God. I believe it. You know, well, quit believing it. We want this, you know, the neighbors are coming. We got to look good. All right, so ashes are the clean place. And, and they're outside the camp. Ash heap there. In that one and in the uh, red heifer or outside the camp. Um, and I wrote down, what is not yet ashes is consumed. And it's consumed where the ashes are poured out. All right. <clears throat> oh, and I remember up here saying something like, what was it? Oh, oh. When Abraham said, I, I, am, I am but dust and ashes, I wrote down, don't rise from the ashes. Don't be a phoenix. Don't rise. Don't do it. Don't do it. The, the, I bet there's books that says, rising from the ashes, and it'll teach you how to get up out of it. You know, I'm going to escape this hard place. You know. All right. So... Um, <clears throat> Leviticus 6, 9. <clears throat> Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning. And the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. And the priest shall put on his linen garments and his linen breeches, that's Deb's word, his linen breeches, shall he put upon his flesh and take up the ashes, meaning gather up the ashes. See, we can be gathering up. What, is the, what does this say up here? Gathering up. Oh, it says gathering up the ashes. <laughs> Long after this is over, we can be gathering up the ashes and presenting it to him in glory. <clears throat> All right. So uh, take... <clears throat> Take up the ashes, gather up, which the fire hath consumed. And take uh, and the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. There it is again. And he shall put off his garments and put on the other garments and carry forth, gather up and carry forth the ashes outside the camp unto a clean place, which there is no clean place unless there's ashes dumped there. It doesn't become clean till the ashes arrive. It's not like he goes and sweeps a little, little area, you know, carpets it, and, you know, and then let's dump the ashes here. It's real nice. <laughs> He's not looking for real nice. That, it's not the place. It's the spirit of ashes that counts, that makes it clean. <clears throat> um... Let's see, there's a place on here that I want to look at again. The altar. Oh, uh, 
it, this, the verse is um, verse uh, 9, and the, the last of it reads like this, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. <clears throat> but when I glanced in it, do you ever do this? When I glanced in it, I only saw part of that verse. And this is the part my eyes landed on. The altar shall be burning in it. The altar shall be burning in us. Producing what? Ashes. <laughs> All right, how about a little bit of Jeremiah? Ooh, we love Jeremiah sometimes. <clears throat> Jeremiah 4.14. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? Okay? Wash your heart. See? Wash your heart. From what? From wickedness. How long shall thy vain thoughts find a lodging within you? That's the way he looks at it. You're allowing something to live in you that is against what the Lord is trying to produce, but your mind thinks that way, and you, you know, and you you surround yourself with everything that thinks that way, so it's gotta be that way. But when it comes to the Lord, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because ultimately the way that he thinks is all that counts. Nothing else will stand. Okay? So back to Leviticus now. <clears throat> Leviticus 15, 13. This will be the one on uh, the last one on that. How long have I been going? Any clue? Okay. Two hours? Exactly one hour? Okay. Leviticus 15, 13. This is... This is, I've got it following, O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? This is Leviticus 15, 13. And when he had that, uh, when he had that hath an issue, when he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue. Oh my God, there's our hearts. We need to be cleaned of our, cleansed from our issues. Yeah. Our issues are so big to us. They're, so, they're everything. They're our life. Well, this is my life. No, I mean, you know, we wouldn't say that's my life, but it's the life you live in. Right. You know, well, there's this issue, and then there's that issue, and why do you people make all these issues for me? Why are you not washed from your issue, you know? Yeah. And when he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue. <laughs> I just love that one too. It just, it just, it's like, here's the way it hits me. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yeah. You know, and then I do this and he goes, <laughs> I turn the other cheek and he goes, thank you. <laughs> that was scriptural, Randy. <laughs> that last one was a little hard there. <laughs> Uh, and when he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue, then he shall number to himself seven days, does this sound familiar? For his cleansing, and wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in running water, and shall be clean. All right, so what I was going to rush madly through and not do it now, because <clears throat> we're going to stop, um, is uh, Naaman. Anybody remember the story of Naaman? The guy who needed to yeah who needed to wash in the jordan uh what a great story and you know what the the main thing about the story is it's all about the uh, contrast constantly from start to finish it's about a contrast of greatness compared to ashes mm -hmm. the hero of the story isn't elisha 
It's not Naaman. It's an unnamed servant girl who was made captive by the Syrians who had answers. <laughs> and they kind of, you know, they get up, you know, they get upset about anything that's lowly trying to tell them what's right or what they should do. You know, it's like, you know, what? You know, but then finally, you know, Naaman goes and, and then, you know, he comes to Elisha's house and, you know, tells him the story, I'm a leper and I want to be cleansed and, you know, and he just sends word by his servant. He says, go wash in the Jordan. Go wash this off for you. He gets upset. No, he gets in a rage. He gets in a rage. He, why would you get in a rage? If this could help you, why would you, this make you go into a rage? Why, Naaman? Is it your leprosy? <clears throat> why would you go into a rage when somebody's actually trying to help you and really means it? So he, he goes off and then, his servants say, hey, if he asked you to do some great thing, you would have done it gladly. And then you would have thought you earned it. And you would have thought it was your greatness. But now it's just a simple thing. It's not that big. Well, it is for me. Okay, well, when, <laughs> how's that go? And when he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but if you're like, you need to be cleansed of your issue first. Not it's not the um, the leprosy. It, it's the issues that you have, and it causes you to react, and you don't understand it, and or, you know, and everybody else doesn't either. <laughs> they don't. You know, you can't understand that stuff because the issue is not the issue. Amen. The issue uh, wasn't the issue. His, his leprosy wasn't the issue. His pride was the issue. Can I get an oh me? Yeah. All right. So I'm not going to go into this story, but to say, uh, Noah, there was water, and I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm really stopping. I am genuinely, look, I'm closing up the book. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. So I think we should pray. Do y'all think we should pray? Um, I'm just wondering how this would work. Could, is there any way we could socially distance and yet come up here and be and have our masks and and I'll just pray through a slight gap so you don't catch my bad breath. Um, Y'all, those that can, come on up here. Get behind me, socially distanced from everyone around you. Shields up. Maybe I can pray with this, like here. Hallelujah. Lord, we are serious. We can spend the rest of our life fighting issues because of our leprosy, but our leprosy is not the issue. It is our pride. It is us. It is the things that we think are important and no one else thinks is important, and that, that bugs us. But you are faithful. You have, you have spoken to us several times. Um, through this night and through this day. You're, you care. You want to reach us. We can, we can just go through another gathering and enjoy it, and yet the real things that needed dealing with never got touched. We keep them hidden, locked away in a lockbox that is strong, But Lord, we spent the mornings yelling out, yes, Lord, and saying, yes, we want you. We want you beyond what we have let you in. Yes. 
And we ask you, Father, to, that though, though that my ways of sharing or saying things or whatever may be not good to some people, may they hear your voice now, right now. Speak to them. Let them know this is you, it's not me, that they're not supposed to look at the vessel, they're supposed to receive the message. And Father, it's your message of your heart. You want us with you, you want us closer. We follow behind but we never get up close enough to you to let the light shine that'll bring us to our knees and open our heart and let you take over. Father, ashes may seem impossible if our pride is so big. It's Leviathan, the king of pride. It's not too big for you. Goliath was full of himself and full of his tribe. And you took a young boy with a slingshot to take him down. It's that easy. It's that easy. It's what we need is small weapons, ashes, dust, and washing and father we just we don't know what to do if we really knew how to just flip the switch we would do it but lord we don't want to come back again and pray the same kind of prayers and and not Remember or not be serious afterwards. Lord, if there any way through the length of this gathering that you could drive a stake in the heart of our demons, if you will, <clears throat> and let us know, and we let you know that together, together, this can be removed. But, but you gave us free will. And we have to use our will. We have to say yes with a will that says, yes, I'm going. I'm coming now, Lord. I'm going to go after this. I, I don't want to be high. I want to be what you want me to be. And if that's ashes, that's what I want to be because I want what you want. Even if it goes against my pride now, I want to say against my pride, yes, Lord, I want you. <clears throat> Lord, teach us in every circumstance to be willing to quickly just sit down in that lowest seat, just, just knock people out of the way to get over there uh, and no longer fight, no longer uh, accuse, no longer um, wrestle, no longer go through all those things, just a knock things, whatever's blocking to get to that lower seat and just sit down. And if Jesus brings me out of it and brings me up, that's his business. And he'll do more than just do it to, to appease my pride. He will do it because he's changed us and now we're ready to be used in a different way without pride without thinking we're something or being upset because we're not being seen. Lord, we love you. We love you, Jesus. You died for us. You were a clean person and you became unclean so that we could be clean. Oh, what a, what a violation of reality if we take that very thing that you did and in our pride make it make us something higher instead of wanting that spirit in us it's a statute you've made forever it will not change in your heart 
We are fools to ask for the things you're trying to. In truth, we're fools to ask for the things that you already put to death at the cross. So, Lord, see us here up front standing for the rest of us that are on Skype or Zoom or whatever. See us here standing together and saying yes and, and meaning, meaning m much more violent than yes. <laughs> meaning do something radical. Do something radical and change the course of this ill wind that is blowing us. We do want to be like you, Jesus, but in our hearts, I hope when we say that, we're talking about being God himself and becoming the lowest even unto death by, by unclean men. Not even being put to death like the red heifer by a clean person, but by unclean men. Lord, may we understand that. May we understand the statute. May we go beyond that and the statute and may we see what is in your heart in these areas. Release it in the Spirit of God. Release it upon us and in us and around us and make it the way that we, we think and the way we walk and the way this church functions. And we ask it, Father. We ask it in the name of the only one who could accomplish it and did so, so that he could come into us and accomplish it in his body, us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.